alarming television programmes raise the fearful prospect of vast tidal waves flooding Britain. But what causes the sea level to change and how fast does it happen? Sea level changes over the world in general are governed fundamentally by two factors. What we would call local factors, the relationship of the sea to the land, which often, by the way, is to do with the land rising or falling than anything to do with the sea. But if you're talking about what we call eustatic changes of sea, worldwide changes of sea, that's through the thermal expansion of the oceans, nothing to do with melting ice. And that's an enormously slow and long process. People say, oh, I see the ocean doing this last year. That means that something changed in the atmosphere last year. And this is not necessarily true at all. In fact, it's actually quite unlikely because it can take hundreds to thousands of years for the deep ocean to respond to uh, forces and changes that are taking place at the surface. It is also suggested that even a mild rise in temperature will lead to the spread northward of deadly insect-borne tropical diseases like malaria. But is this true? Professor Paul Reiter of the Pasteur Institute in Paris is recognized as one of the world's leading experts on malaria and other insect-borne diseases. He is a member of the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Committee, was chairman of the American Committee of Medical Entomology of the American Society for Tropical Medicine, and lead author on the health section of the US National Assessment of the Potential Consequences of Climate Variability. As Professor Reiter is eager to point out, mosquitoes thrive in very cold temperatures. Mosquitoes are not specifically tropical. Most people will realize that in temperate regions there are mosquitoes. Um, in fact, mosquitoes are extremely abundant uh, in the Arctic. The most devastating epidemic of malaria was in the Soviet Union in the 1920s. There were something like 13 million cases a year and something like 600,000 deaths. A tremendous catastrophe that reached up to the Arctic Circle. Archangel had 30,000 cases and about 10,000 deaths. So it's not a tropical disease. Yet these people uh, in, in, in the global warming fraternity invent the idea that malaria will move northwards. Climate scare stories cannot be blamed solely on sloppy or biased journalism. According to Professor Reiter, hysterical alarms have been encouraged by the reports of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. On the spread of malaria, the IPCC warns us that Mosquito species that transmit malaria do not usually survive where the mean winter temperature drops below 16 to 18 degrees Celsius. According to Professor Reiter, this is clearly untrue. I was horrified uh, to read the second and the third assessment reports because there was so much misinformation without any kind of recourse or virtually without mention of uh, the scientific literature, the truly scientific literature, the literature by specialists in those fields. In a letter to the Wall Street Journal, Professor Frederick Seitz, former president of America's National Academy of Sciences, revealed that IPCC officials had censored the comments of scientists. He said that, This report is not the version that was approved by the contributing scientists. At least 15 key sections of the science chapter had been deleted these included statements like, None of the studies cited has shown clear evidence that we can attribute climate changes to increases in greenhouse gases. No study to date has positively attributed all or part of the observed climate changes to man-made causes. Professor Seitz concluded, I have never witnessed a more disturbing corruption of the peer review process than the events that led to this IPCC report. In its reply, the IPCC did not deny making these deletions, but it said there was no dishonesty or bias in the report and that uncertainties about the cause of global warming had been included. The changes had been made, it said, in response to comments from governments, individual scientists and non-governmental organisations. When I resigned from the IPCC, I thought that was the end of it. But when I saw the final draft, my name was still there, so I asked for it to be removed. Well, they told me that I had contributed so it would remain there. So I said, no, I haven't contributed because they haven't listened to anything I've said. 
So in the end, it was quite a battle. But finally, I threatened legal action against them, and they removed my name. And I think this happens a great deal. Those people who are specialists but don't agree with the polemic and resign, and there have been a number that I know of, uh, they are simply put on the author list and become part of this 2,500 of the world's top scientists. Research relating to man-made global warming is now one of the best-funded areas of science. The US government alone spends more than $4 billion a year. According to NASA climatologist Roy Spencer, scientists who speak out against man-made global warming have a lot to lose. It's generally harder to get uh, research proposals funded uh, because of the stands that we've taken publicly. And you'll find very few of us that are willing to take a public stand because it does cut into their research funding. It is a common prejudice that scientists who do not agree with the theory of man-made global warming must be being paid by private industry to tell lies. I get it all the time. You must be in the pay of the multinationals. Sadly, like most of the scientists you will talk to, I haven't seen a penny from the multinationals. I'm always accused of being paid by the oil and gas companies. I've never received a nickel from the oil and gas companies. I, I, I joke about I wish they would pay me, then I could afford their product. Whenever anybody says that I'm in the pay of an oil company, I say my bank manager would wish. There is almost no private sector investment in climatology. And yet, to be involved in any research project which involves an industry grant, no matter how small, can spell ruin to a scientist's reputation. Modern technology fueled by greenhouse gases. Patrick Michaels is professor of environmental sciences at the University of Virginia. He was chair of the Committee on Applied Climatology at the American Meteorological Society, president of the American Association of State Climatologists, the author of three books on meteorology, and an author and reviewer on the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But when he conducted research which was part funded by the coal industry, he found himself among those under attack from climate campaigners. British-based corporations are some of the worst climate criminals on the planet. Shell is based in the UK, right here in London. We have the right and the duty to take it back into public ownership, dismantle it, break it up, and send its managers to rehabilitation training. But reasoned debate is not the only casualty in the global warming alarm. As international public policy bears down on industrial emissions of carbon dioxide, the developing world is coming under intense pressure not to develop. I'm no expert on climate change, I'm no scientist, and what I'm going to say next is a great big turn off. It's just that. Turn it off! Anything you don't need, you're not using, it, it's easier than you think to make a difference. Delegates from around the world are flying into Nairobi for a conference sponsored by the UN to talk about global warming. Civil servants, professional NGO campaigners, carbon offset fund managers, environmental journalists and others will discuss every aspect of man-made climate change. From how to promote solar panels in Africa to the relationship between global warming and sexism. The conference lasts 10 days. The number of delegates exceeds 6,000. The billions of dollars vested in climate science means there is a huge constituency of people dependent upon those dollars. And they will want to see that carry forward. It happens in any bureaucracy. Where I live, we have local council, a local council global warming officer. There's a huge um, tail out there of people who have, in one way or another, been recruited to join this particular bandwagon. Anybody who then who stands up and says, hey, wait a minute, let's look at this coolly and rationally and carefully and see actually how much merit, how much uh, this stands up, uh, they will be ostracized. Scientists accustomed to the relative civility and obscurity of academic life suddenly find themselves publicly attacked if they dare to challenge the theory of man-made global warming.